All right, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I see the folks are trickling in. We're going to get promptly started, if you folks don't mind. First of all, I'm excited that everybody's here today for an amazing conversation about Black women in care. So on behalf of myself and staff at Caring Across Generations, welcome to Black Women in Caregiving. This is our first Twitter space dedicated to conversations around Blackness and how it intersects with caregiving. And today we will be joined by Caring Across Generations staff, Rebecca Alexander, who is our individual giving manager. Aisha Actons, constituency organizer and special guest Brandy Evans, actress known for many roles, including P Valley. We're so excited to have you. And as always, I'm Shantae Wolf, campaigns director. Before we dive in, I just want to do a little housekeeping. If this is your first time using Twitter space, if you're on iOS, be sure to tap the first three columns, you'll see three dots right next to leave. If you need to turn on captioning, that is accessible for folks if you need it. And if you have questions, we'll do breaks intermittently between the conversation, but we won't get to them. But we do have someone, if it's Hayo, who is our comms manager, who will be keeping an eye out for hands raised. So without further ado, I'd like to bring in our panelists and start with none other than Brandy Evans. And our question is, how and when did you become a caregiver? Hey, y'all. How y'all doing? Okay. Oh, my gosh. How and when did I become a caregiver? You know what? It kind of started before I really got mama out of the nursing home in 2016. So before that, I was just flying back home, trying to take care of her when she was at assisted living. What did they call it? It was it assisted living? It was like the places that they have where it's like the elderly or disabled and they're there and they still have their own freedom. So I would go home and check on her and all of that. And then she had a big fall when I was on tour with Lettucey at the time. And that ended her ending up being in a nursing and rehabilitation center. So after that started happening, I was like, okay, my mom is in a nursing home, Lord, and that is exactly what I promised her I would never do as a child. So I didn't have the money to get her out of it, so I just was trying to figure it all out, did a GoFundMe, and many people around the world chimed in. They reposted all of that, so that was able to help me get her out of the nursing home. I did, I kind of cased it out, kind of like on set it off, when they went around and it was right. how they was going to rob that bank <laughs> went around to the nursing home and I literally cased it out. I was taking footage. I was like, so how do y'all bathe my mom? And they thought I was just trying to be interested, but really I was trying to figure out what I needed at home because I knew nothing about this journey. So I was mm -hmm. taking video footage and taking notes and then looking at how much the equipment really cost. So I was like, oh Lord, I can't afford this. So that's when I was like, I need some help with doing the GoFundMe at that time. So I got mama on December 21st out of the nursing home, 2016. And that's when it started. And I was completely green. And that's why I'm here today to help y'all child. Cause I felt like I had nobody helping me with what I had to do. It was a lot. Yeah. And a lot of what you said, Brandy, is so parallel to a lot of experiences of Black women doing caregiving in the South, which brings me to my point with Aisha, who is a myriad of things amongst amazing, but also does caregiving right in Georgia. So Aisha, I'm curious to hear your take on this. What do you think? Thank you so much, Shantae and Brandy. It's wonderful to have you with us. I agree. I think it's definitely a... Yeah, a shared theme, a shared thread among folks who are providing care for family members, for chosen family and the like, is that we enter these roles oftentimes unprepared and you know, in the middle of an emergency, right? There's an event that takes place that puts us in this role. And unfortunately, it's during a time of crisis that we are also then trying to coordinate and to research and to investigate what resources are available, what those processes include and look like. And meanwhile, <laughs> the people that we are concerned with making sure that they are safe and cared for are still vulnerable. And so we find ourselves juggling so many different things. And I know that in my personal experience and caring for my mother and now my father as well. That's something that was a, an immediately a challenge for me, particularly at a young age at 27. 
trying to understand the definition of things like Medicare and Medicaid and what is the difference between these two these two systems and kind of navigating these uh, these worlds that were completely foreign to me until those those pivotal moments and so it's certainly a common occurrence and folks who are in similar circumstances can relate for certain and that's such an important point and when I go to this next question Rebecca I'm curious to hear what you think because all of this is pointing to the thing that a lot of us experience across the spectrum of womanhood which is the strong black woman trope you know, historically as an archetype of how the ideal Black woman should act, how we should respond to crises. And even when things are difficult, just like you were saying, Brandy, we're the first ones in there. Okay, how are y'all taking care of this? How are y'all doing this? How am I going to afford this? It doesn't matter. I got to push through. So I'll start with you, Rebecca, first. How does the strong Black woman trope influence how you see yourself? And how does it impact how other people see you? Oh, my Thank you for asking that question, Shante. And I also just want to thank Brandy again for being with us and for really lending your story to this movement that we are trying to build in support of care for all. I guess, how does it influence how I see myself? It influences how I show up every day. I mean, I apart from my care responsibilities, just as this Black woman in general, I feel like it is my job to overcome everything that is thrown at me. I remember some tough conversations I had with my grandmother actually when I was a young girl, early stages of puberty. And this is long before care was even a factor. And Mm -hmm. my grandmother, a strong black woman, no, in her way, thinking that she was trying to encourage strength and grace in me, essentially told me, look, the rules aren't the same for us. And you need to know that. And it's not fair but more will be asked of you. And you just need to be ready. And as a good old Christian woman, she certainly, of course, brought God and prayer and all of that into the equation. And just like, you're going to have to endure more. And it couldn't be more true than it is now (laughs) in in the care space. Yes. I would love to chime in. I agree with that. It's so funny when I was just kind of looking through the questions last night and I saw that and I paused because I was like, I have a whole tattoo with my mom and I got it. She always would tell me to stay strong. And last night, the first time it hit me and I was like, that's cool, but then it's not. But like, I was like, wow. And we have these diamonds on it because grandma would say, stay strong like a diamond. They don't break. And so we've got this whole thing where we say we're diamond strong and all of that. But sometimes I don't want to be strong, y'all. And it is so hard because I feel like we don't have the choice, like Rebecca was saying. It's just like, it's so much that's on us. Like literally right before this, I'm talking to the home health company. Like I need a new neck brace for mama. I need to do this. And I feel like if I don't do it, it doesn't get done right. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's because I've been told that since I was a little girl, stay strong, you can handle it, you can do it. But it's also not healthy. So I, I hope that everyone that's listening knows that it's okay to not be strong sometimes. We're, we're trying to hold that up, but it will make us break and we cannot be the best that we need to be for others or ourselves if we don't have that moment to not be strong sometimes. You cannot pour from an empty cup. And I think that's the biggest thing here. I actually want to take a quick pause. For those that just joined us, we are here with the amazing Brandy Evans, alongside Rebecca, Aisha, Ifatayo, and myself, Shantae Wolf. And we're talking about Black women and caregiving. I like to open it up to the floor. I see someone has already raised their hand. And I'll actually pose the question to you. How does the strong Black woman trope influence how you see yourself? I ask that you keep it to a minute so that we can make space for a robust conversation but it looks like we had Carmen Carmel hello everyone hello. shout out to all the amazing caregivers we the mothers of the world <laughs> I'm in California and I have to say just being a black woman just makes us natural mothers, natural caregivers, but we do shed a lot of tears privately like mothers do. Oftentimes, to that point, conversations around caregiving, uh, particularly in Black households, we talk about what the caregiver does for the people around them without addressing the needs of caregivers. So considering you have an amazing career, Brandy, I just would like your perspective because I also know you do this sort of work because I know you wear many hats as well. What are some things that Black caregivers need the most, in your opinion, and what do we not need? You know what? We need help. 
We need resources, the community around us, and we need for people to not assume that we can do it all by ourselves. I'm very much so collaborative with my caregiver, Miss Edith. We are family at this point. Like it's, it, I don't see her as my mom's caregiver. I see her as Auntie Edith. She is a part of the family now. And we need that help. Like, it, and I think that I have for a very long time, I was afraid to ask for help or even just to let people help me. And honestly, Edith has helped me with that. We share the same car child. We work together truly like family. And I think that that is what's important when you are trying to make for that healthy foundation and teamwork makes the dream work. And we cannot do it all. So I think a lot of times we think that we can do it by ourselves and we can't. So we need help. We need to allow space to be helped. And people need to not assume that, oh, it's just that strong Black women, the strong Black trophy, that they can do it. They've got it. Because like Miss Carmel just said, there are a lot of tears shed behind closed doors that we don't talk about. That's a fact there. Aisha, Rebecca, you all have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's important to also take into consideration the fact that, unfortunately, Black women are a part of that statistic generation after generation who are dealing with the systemic challenges of health inequities. With health challenges comes an increased need for care, and that care becomes cyclical, right? And so you have generation after generation of Black women in these roles taking care of family members, of community members in many cases, looking after children and other folks who come into your, your realm. The challenge with that is that if you don't have access to the care that you need to look after your physical health, things like making sure that your blood pressure is in check while you're managing very stressful situations oftentimes, then you are at greater risk for cardiovascular disease, which then could put you in a situation where there is a greater likelihood that you may suffer a stroke or develop type 2 diabetes and end up requiring care yourself. And so it's important we talk about breaking generational cycles. Although care is oftentimes a privilege and for some it's viewed as a rite of passage and many do it from a place of love, it's also about making sure that we are examining the toll that care can take on us and really explore why is it a constant within our communities at this level? And what can we do, as Brandy said, to make sure that folks have access to the resources that they need to get the support so that we are decreasing the severity and the impact that caregiving can take on, on our community of Black women. I'm seeing some hearts uh, and a lot of resonance showing up on folks' profiles. Uh, Rebecca, you care to chime in on what do caregivers need the most and what do we not need? Sure. I mean, oh my gosh, just like so many amens to all of the <laughs> great feedback before about what we need. I think, oh, and I could stay on my pulpit for a minute just talking about all the things that we need to make care genuinely the more enjoyable experience that it should be for all of us. But I would say let's start with kind of chipping away at the strong woman trope because I think that's it's probably one of the most isolating and it's not even just unique to the black female experience I feel like it's a female experience as a whole we're just expected to carry our burdens with grace and to be the carriers of all the problems to fix without really building the sense of community that we all see is actually what's needed by Brandy's own words her mother's caregiver is now a member of that family and when it was me and my grandmother was in the home and we had someone, that person was a member of our family. What we really need is to come back to this narrative and figure out, does it really make sense for us to have this expectation that we should be able to handle all of this on our own? Or is the reality that maybe we've evolved into a society that has become so individualistic, we're detached from the very real generational expectations of care. And the main reason for our unpreparedness is that we've just become too isolated. And that's totally apart from pandemic given, right? Like removing that from the picture, it's incredibly complex for us to build these support mm. systems. And mm. the main way that we fix that is by building community. Yes, I love that. Yeah, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Brandy? Oh, no, that, that is exactly it, building the community. I'm just thinking about, though I have Miss Edith, 
there we can't burn Miss Edith out either. So I just thought about caregiver burnout and thinking about the community with that. I do have my friends that I can call on and say, hey, listen, we got to let Miss Edith go home early today. She needs some rest, but I might have an interview. Or I've got to still do something. Can y'all help me? And when I tell you, I have finally built that sense of community with my family and my friends out here in Los Angeles that they can come through, be like, okay, I got mom in the bed. Now who can feed her dinner? Cause I got to go to this. But I feel like back in the day, that's what I remember seeing growing up. And I don't know where we lost it along mm -hmm. the way, but that's just what I remember seeing growing up. Somebody always was taking care of big mama or somebody like it was mm -hmm. somebody in that house that was around mm -hmm. family. It was a cousin. It was grandma feeding somebody else. That's not even a family member. So I just, to me, that's just normal and, and how it should be. We should reach back because they took care of us. For sure. One thing that you made me think about is how if we don't have that need in the Black caregiving space, it will contribute to how a lot of us fall into hyper-independence and how that puts us in our own silos from getting the support that we need and enacting with self-care. So I 100% agree. Looks like we've had some speakers added since we've asked this question. So I'd like to welcome Joanna to the space. Welcome to the Twitter space. Joanna, what's your question? My question is to Brandy and all of you. And that is, what are some ways that you cope with your stress? So what are some methods that you all use to just get through daily hassles and challenges? Oh, child. Let me tell you, just last week, I dipped off to Atlanta just to hide and go to the gym. And that to me is my therapy. We all, and I know some people like the gym, that is my therapy because it's the one time that I can do something for me. Even when I'm home and even if Miss Edith is here, it's great, but I still feel that need. Let me go see what does mama need? What is, and it's like, wait a minute, what does Brandy need? So I work out. I have to leave the house. Sometimes we got to leave the place where the work is, y'all to find that because you'll end up back here again in your mind. So if you got to get up a little earlier to do something for yourself, I don't care if it's a walk, meditation, I've started meditating. I actually got a therapist that is so important. I didn't believe in it when I was younger, which is very ignorant because I'm like, what am so I supposed to tell my problems? What happened at home, stay at home. Child, you're gonna stay in your head and be all over the place. So therapy is so important. I think that everyone needs it. Exercise, eating right. To call a friend, you know what I mean? Like vent it out sometimes because we also hold on to these things. And when you hold on to it, you're about to break. And I remember a lot of times when I first got mama, my best friend Sasha would see me just come out of mama's room and just kind of lose it. And she would be like, I got it. And she'd take over feeding mama while I breathe. But you've got you to gotta have somebody that you can vent to and have that safe space because it's so important. It does not make you a bad person. It's okay, y'all. It's okay to say, what is this? Why am I doing it? I'm tired. That does not make you a bad person. I had to learn that. Yes, 100% everything you just shared, Brandy. I would add to that, in addition to therapy, that is something that is so important. And it's something that takes persistence and commitment, just as with meditation, just as with exercise. I would add to that making sure that we are treating our bodies, feeding ourselves nutritious foods, balancing that with some good soul food, some down-home cooking, but making sure that we are, because sometimes, okay, you may not, if you're not working and you don't have health insurance, maybe the least you can do is if you pull up to Mickey D's, order that salad, put half the ranch dressing on it. Sometimes it's making those choices to nourish yourself and, and for the long run instead of comfort yourself in that moment. And that's where you can get that support from therapy. And there are so many incredible resources around, you know, therapists who cater specifically to women of color and who have scholarship programs and sliding scale fees. So it's much more accessible than it once was as well. I would also, though, include setting boundaries, right? Ooh, With yes. It's important to set those boundaries. Talk about it. Yes, talk about it. Set like set those boundaries early. Repeat them as often as necessary. Because sometimes every family member becomes the expert. They become a medical expert, financial expert, legal expert, when you're the one that has the primary responsibility. And so making sure that folks understand that you love them, but you may have to love them from a distance for a while in order to make sure that your people are taken care of properly. I almost threw my phone out the window. Yes, I, I already yes. threw it. And, and I, yes. threw it Brandy. I threw the phone. I got it back. I turned it back on and I'm here now. <laughs> yes. Yes. So many, like, my goodness, so many amen moments from this comment. Yes. 
Brandy and Aisha are completely on point. Just want to piggyback off of the importance of your health. Look, full transparency, I have struggled with my weight my whole life. I have been a type 2 diabetic, and thankfully, I'm in remission right now. Make sure that you prioritize physical activity. Make sure you prioritize wholesome nutrition. Look, I'm gonna be, keep it real. I ain't no tiny girl. All right. I ain't no tiny itty bitty. Okay. I'm nowhere near where the doctors think I should be with my health, but I was able to get my numbers back to where they needed to be for my long-term health with physical activity and watching my weight. And so the point is you don't have to look like what they expect you to look like or what they want you to look like in order for you to be a healthier and more present person for yourself and for your family. So just uplifting that. Also want to make sure while we're adding to the conversation around boundaries, um, one, don't be afraid to ask for help. Do not be afraid to ask for help and to ask for help on your terms. And it's not because we're being critical or picky about the folks that are taking care of our loved ones in a sense that we don't trust them. It's about we have routines and we are the experts in our loved one's care. And we are more than allowed to assert ourselves as the leaders and as the ones who they should be consulting with about changing anything in your loved one's routines. You are your own expert. And that also means when you are engaging as a caregiver with your loved one's care providers, the doctors, even with your own doctors, it is easy to turn into this hermit crab because a lot of the experience and how we engage with the medical community really does patronize us, really does infantilize us, really does minimize our pain, our experiences, our circumstances. Look, don't be afraid to be honest with your providers about the limitations of what you can do. Because you know what? Our providers also need to understand that before they propose certain solutions, we are all living full and complete lives with lots of responsibilities. And it is unfair when we enter these circumstances, especially with our doctors, where it feels like we are constantly being coached at or belittled for what we're not doing for ourselves. And it's like, we understand that you are absolutely right. I need to do more for myself. But let's just talk about the circumstances. Let's be real about what we're working with here. Because you know what? Our providers need to be a part of this advocacy conversation as well. And the only way that they can is if we are stronger in our positions about what we can and cannot do. And really draw those boundaries with them too. Yeah. And just briefly, I would like wow. to interject just to make sure that when you are advocating, don't let the letters after the name or the white coat scare you from speaking up. Get that second, third, fourth opinion. It took four different times for me to get my mother properly diagnosed with the right form of dementia and therefore get her on the right track for care. They are human and it's okay to disagree. No one knows your people better than you do. It's about having a trusted care team around you. I'm going to yeah. say something very um, nostalgic, but my grandma would always say black don't crack, but we age faster on the inside. And that is especially right for black women. So I echo all that's been said about getting help. And Joanna, if you're still with us, one thing that I want to stress is the importance of saying no. May it free you from the shackles of over committing, over showing up in ways that you really don't need to. We need ourselves for the long run. And like I said at the beginning of this call, you cannot pour from an empty cup. So I've seen a lot of static and emojis in the chat. Welcome to those that just joined. I'll take another round of questions. Any reflections that anyone in the crowd like to share before we move on? I did want to say <laughs> I was a caregiver giver for my mom on and off for from the time I was like 18 to the time I was 29 when she died. Y'all, if y'all are in caregiving situations, please listen to these folks. I did the exact opposite of what they are suggesting. It's taken me a long time to reclaim myself. But yeah, y'all are so right. You can't pour from the empty cup. And shout out to everybody who's taking care of their moms, especially you, Brandy. Like, you're amazing. You and your mom kind of remind me of me and my mom. Obviously, I'm not on a hit show, but she did have MS. And it warms my heart every time that I see y'all on Instagram. That's all I had to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've been talking a lot about some of the things that are difficult about caregiving, but I'd actually like to talk about something about how we thrive. So whoever would like to go first with this question, how has caregiving added a, a sense of purpose to your life? And does caregiving bring joy to your life? Yes. <laughs> It makes me smile now, child, because in the beginning I was like, ooh, what did I do? It really does. And I just think of it like 
I'm having, I've said this before, I, it's bittersweet because I'm having all of these moments with my mom now that I wish I could have had when we were younger. When I was younger, like I want to have girls day. I want to go to the movies. I want to do all these things. And it's bittersweet that I'm able to do it now, but also the caregiving side of it. So instead of thinking about that, I just smile and I'm like, all right, today we're going to go here. We're going to do this. And y'all bump the celebrity of it all. I'm talking to just Every day, nine to five, trying to make it because I've been there and I haven't forgotten. There's still a way to find that joy. When I have videos up, if you go back and look at my stories on Instagram, y'all, where literally me and mama would just walk down the street in North Hollywood and go to the nail salon, child, it don't matter, it's the hood. We didn't care, we had the best I love time. It. Like today is nail day, mama. Okay, we're gonna go to brunch and might spend 15, $20 because that's all I could afford. But we had the best time. So you can still have the best time with your loved ones sit up, find the movies that they like. We have movie day, all the things. Talk to them about things you, you never got a chance to talk to them about. And if they can't talk, like my mama sometimes, they can. They still feel you. So even you talking it out and just speaking it to them, I've learned now is so much joy because I used to sit around quiet sometimes. So I'm like, she can't talk back, man. Like, what am I doing? I'm just like, what happens that day when you wake up and she's not there for you to talk to at all? So just spread it out. I mean, even anything drama in relationships like I love to be like oh mom did they act like that when you was trying to date I mean she'll chuckle and I can't get the sentence out but I know mama know what I'm saying so just enjoy the moment that you have because I know that there will be a time coming where I won't have this time so it does bring me joy because there's going to be a moment when I won't have that opportunity Aisha Rebecca care to share yeah, it's interesting. I was telling someone today, I resonate m much of what you shared. Uh, once again, Randy resonates with me. And it's really interesting because I began caring for my mother when I was 27. And my, my peers were at the club or they were going after their dream job or buying their first home, getting married, all of these these things that we use to measure success. Right. And it was really depressing and frustrating. And I was angry and I had all these different emotions because that's all a part of the grief and the anticipatory grief, particularly when you're caring for someone with a progressive disease over a long span of time. But there was one moment when everything just kind of clicked for me. And I'll use actually last night as an example. I was doing Beat Shazam with my parents and there there was a mother and daughter on the show and their relationship and then also the mother's relationship to music made me tear up because it reminded me so much of the way that my mother used music. She's always had a beautiful singing voice. And, and I began to kind of mourn what I thought I should have had or what it could have, what our relationship could have been like. And then my mother started singing Boogie Oogie Oogie and I cried for other reasons. I was so grateful just for that sweet moment and it was a reminder of the revelation that I had years ago about reprioritizing what's important understanding what is permanent versus what is temporary and our lives are very temporary and very fragile I only have one set of parents I am blessed to have a wonderful relationship with them albeit imperfect but it's beautiful jobs and cars and relationships all of those things Lord willing will be there and I have to I had to learn to be patient and I'm not always happy about it but it once I had that understanding, things really changed for me. That's amazing. I love that. Learn to be patient. That has definitely taught me patience, caregiving. Because child, no matter how you try to speed it up or want something to happen, you can't. And you just you're going to learn the, the hard way, or you're just going to have to. You're going to deal with it the easy way and just say I'm going to be patient, or you're going to learn the hard way. I definitely learned the hard way. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. We all take turns learning the hard way, Brandy. <laughs> all, <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> all do. We all do. But, you know, I just, I guess for me, think, and I really just want to uplift that I did not feel this way until I found a community of caregivers. So I, I want to definitely just keep bringing it back to so much of your experience with care has to do with the level of isolation that you'll feel. And it is so important to try to break that as early as possible in the process and find people, connect to communities, connect to organizations, connect to, honestly, even the legislators that you know that actually care about care. I mean, the point is, we need to keep this sense of togetherness going. And as far as my experience with my mom and my grandmother, gosh, I guess my grandmother 
just passed away this September 2021 after 10 years of caregiving and only four months after I had moved back in with my mother. That was hard. That was really hard. With the pandemic being away, she had contracted COVID, unfortunately, in the nursing home. We had to deal with that scare. I've had a lot of feelings around what I didn't have, but what I've been able to realize on the other side, and even now in caring for my mom post-stroke, I had time with her. That the the fact is, because I cared for her, some of my memories are some of the most intimate memories, um, apart from even my childhood. I would say that we have a deeper connection. I feel like I understand her spirit more. I understand her struggle more. As far as my mother, I'm deeply looking forward to the opportunity of her one day helping to watch her grandkids. And not necessarily because I want to burden her, but because I want my mom in the home. I want her to pass those values and traditions and to frustrate my husband by teaching my child Spanish first the way she did with me. The little, the things that you can only get from your parent and from your loved one. There's just that connection. And it really does absolutely change your life and change the way you see yourself and how you engage with the world. The thing that we need is just more help. That's really it. It's just building an infrastructure that allows us to have the help we need and not just suffer in silence and to know where to go. We shouldn't really have to be on this fishing expedition for to find home care and to figure out what it's going to cost for the medication and to figure out if I can afford bringing like it, it just doesn't need to be this mystery. We are working in an antiquated system that doesn't acknowledge how long people are living nor the economic resources that our generation is facing and it's just got to change it doesn't have to be this way we can all really go back to enjoying being that generational family household that really does uplift and support each other through the ages rebecca what day is it it must be sunday because you're preaching shawty uh, <laughs> i mean goodness let's just pack it up and go home now i'm just kidding i'd like to bring up Jackie, who I've seen come on and then we'll do Celeste. And then I actually want to pivot a little bit to talk about what's in the back and probably the front of most folks' mind. And that's Ro. Jackie, you with us? Hi. So one of the things that I just wanted to mention with caring for my mom had taught me was to just sing out, out loud. My mom, she had dementia and she recently had past but we would just hang out in public and sometimes she would just sing and I, at first I, I'd let say like shh like stop 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 but then after some time I just started seeing too and so having those moments where she just kind of taught me like don't care about what these other people say you're spending time with me and that's what matters and so having those moments where she just taught me to be in the moment really taught me how to I guess cherish life I love that that's beautiful thank you for sharing yeah I just want to just Shout out. Thank you so much for sharing. I am, yeah, I'm so grateful to yeah have some amazing news to share coming up soon and how you'll be working with Caring Across. But I, I just appreciate, I appreciate that level set because there are so many stigmas associated with many of the conditions that we are, in which we are caring for our loved ones. And I so admire that vulnerability and the breaking of those norms and the revitalization of, yeah, of, of dignity to live as oneself, however we present. So thank you so much for sharing that. It's beautiful. Okay. Celeste, are you with us? I am. I am. And I want to thank everyone for sharing. I just, it just made me want to share also when we were talking about the good things that come out of our caregiving journey I was a caregiver for my grandmother. And I would always say I wasn't the oldest granddaughter. I wasn't the daughter. I wasn't the son. I was just the one who kind of locked in when I saw things were changing. And I just wrote it out. And I didn't know until she would, till I was her caregiver that she went to college. Never knew that because she always knew her as someone who worked as a hairstylist and she had salons. Didn't know she met my grandfather in college. Didn't, we would, I mean, everyone's talking about music and I think about how she loved like the most random, she loved the singers on TBN. We would sing this like 
down home Christian inspirational music together. We talk about jazz music. We talk about her upbringing. We talk about how she met my grandfather and how she was so hot to trot in college, but she didn't know how cute she was. And she, all the guys, she, I could have had anyone, she would tell me, but just getting a feel for who she was as a woman and the time she grew up in being born in the thirties, what that meant to be a woman in the 1930s, being born in the thirties be, and being born in the South, being born as a black woman and how all of that impacted the way she lived her life. She would share with me her regrets and she would share with me her experiences and the things she was insecure about, the things she was unconfident about. And I think the best thing that came out of me being her caregiver was just seeing her as a woman and as a person before just grandma. And now we're friends on top of our family relationship. We're friends. And I just, I'll never trade those moments, even though it was rough. It's, I love our relationship now. So I just wanted to share that. So less now you got me over here crying. I know you feel me. This work is so, so rewarding and also so thankless. So while we have everyone here, if you're a caregiver related to a caregiver, which ultimately is also all of us in some ways, I just want to thank you for the work that you are doing. See it. And my mom was also a PE teacher, 34 years in the Georgia school system. So I watched her not only care for children and teach them, but also care for my terminally ill aunt. And that gave me perspective of who's going to have us cared for other than our own communities. But while we keep us safe, it is also our government's responsibility to make sure that we have policies in place so that we won't have to engage in hyper independence and a strong black woman trope in the ways that we fall into in this sort of work with caregiving. So before I go to Ro, I actually want to just go really quickly to a quick question. And this one, I'm going to point to you first, Brandy, because I'm really curious to hear what you think. So in an ideal world, what would you demand for caregivers if you could snap your finger and make something happen right now? What uh, solution would you like to see more of? And that could be policy wise or culturally. You know what? Both in culturally that we all chip in and that we all help our own. I want to see that. But government wise, policy wise, more help. I took my mom to Atlanta season one of Pea Valley and I always thought the South was where that's what we did that at. We took care of our own. It's going to make it so easy, right? Y'all had the worst time trying to find the proper care. They didn't offer anything like they did in Los Angeles. And to this day, I still don't understand. So I want what the opportunities and government funding and all of these things that we have in Los Angeles, I want that to be for everyone all over. Like it's so much that I want to share the different companies that we work with and foundations out here for mama. I want to tell somebody in Kansas about it, but they don't have that. So, but also I want us to share our information because there was a lot of stuff that's going on in California that I found out through the grapevine because somebody else was taking care of big mama or uncle and was like, did you know about IHSS? And I'm like, what's that? That helps you pay for a caregiver. I didn't know that. So I'm borrowing money from Memphis from my friends back home and all of that like you mean to tell me there's somebody there's a whole company that's set up to help but I feel like the access is not there for us for us to know about it rather it's there but they don't want us to know about it that money is going to other places and other people are benefiting but we don't know I remember finally getting approved for some assistance five years in with mama I booked P Valley now and I'm like that's a blessing that's going to help because as y'all know these caregivers are about $25 an hour and up so it's very expensive but the fact that five years not knowing and I've been here and I'm online and I'm posting about it and I'm talking about it but no one's sharing and a random stranger told me one day like why are we not sharing this information so I want everybody to share I want everything to be accessible um accessible for all community. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional because I just think about like if I could snap my finger right now I would create a space where people can have a place that they trust too because as you all know too how many caregivers have we gone through that didn't do it right or didn't care or that were there for the money didn't take care of mama right didn't clean her right didn't feed her right they're just there for a check so I want a space where people are there care first the money will be there but please care wow that's powerful. And the themes that you're thinking of, Brandy, it speaks more to the broader term that Karen Across advocates for and our allies across the t 
p- t- tiers of paid leave. This care infrastructure describes the home and community-based services, programs, peoples, and resources that help all of us live and age in our homes and communities with dignity. If we don't have that, we'll continue to go through this constant cycle of this being double-edged sword of success and also something that is more difficult than it has to be. People shouldn't have to choose between medication or hiring a caregiver or putting food on the table. Those are things that are basic necessities of life that we should never have to deal with as far as tension, but yet in communities, especially in black and brown communities, we deal with that the most. So Aisha, I'm curious to what you think about how can we work to create a care infrastructure that is inclusive of everyone? It's a great question, Shante, and really, Brandy hit all of the proverbial nails on all the proverbial heads in terms of ways that we can create a care infrastructure that is equitable, accessible, and affordable for all of us because there is not one person born on this earth who will not be impacted by care at some point in their life. I would say the one of the most impactful ways that we can make and affect change is through sharing our experiences. I am so grateful to people like Brandy and to folks like Jacqueline, who we just had on the stage and all of the storytellers and the the folks who are being vocal about what their experience is like, the ups and the downs, the joys and the challenges. Talk with your elected officials. Make sure that we are sharing within our own communities, our family, our friends, our coworkers, our book club, our Bible studies, whatever is our kind of our sphere of influence so that we normalize these conversations and get involved. Go to caringacross.org, sign up. We believe in the power of numbers and in collective change. The more folks who come together and amplify and elevate the need for home and community-based resources, the more that we can see those changes implemented, the policymakers are going to hear their constituents and say, you know what? All right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to support this. I'm going to allocate the funds to to go toward making this a true reality. But, you know, again, it's that old adage, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. But if we don't hear from you, we can't get you the help that we that you need. So please reach out, sign up. And myself, my colleagues, many of whom are here in this space, would be more than happy to speak with you and get you plugged in and, yeah, and change the way that we give, receive, and view care in this country. The work is never done. And so long as you have an idea of what needs to be done, we still have a lot of work to do. But I believe that everybody in this Twitter space has an idea on how to win and we shall do so. We have nine minutes left in this Twitter space and I'd be remiss if we didn't take this time to just talk about where Black women stand in America currently. It's no news to anyone, but in case you have been either on vacay with no access to internet, Roe was struck down in a time where we have no formula on the shelves in most rural areas and nationally. We are currently dealing with a system that is telling people what to do with their bodies. So this is something that no matter where you fell on the spectrum for decades, this is a president that a lot of folks were used to. And I'll pose this question. We start with Brandy first and the rest of the panelists. If you could give words of encouragement during this time to a Black woman or anyone that benefits from reproductive rights, because reproductive rights doesn't stop and start with abortion, what would you tell them? Let's start with you, Brandy. Oh my gosh. That that one is so tough for me because it's been it's been hard to even think about. And I think we all feel the same way because it just feels like I'm living in a nightmare. It doesn't feel real. Hope is what comes to mind. I just have hope that we are going to figure this out, that we can get back to having the right of a choice because it is so important. And it's beyond, like you said, it's beyond the abortion rights, y'all. It's so much more. And it doesn't matter what you believe, abortion or not, we should, we all deserve the right to have our own choices about our bodies. So for me, it's just keeping the hope. Do not let this break you and do not let, don't think that this is the end because it's not the end. We got to get out. We got to vote. We got to be active as, as active as we are on social media and y'all get off the shade room and get into these legislative conversations that are happening right now. I think we really need to redirect our focus and what's important because if, even if you're not thinking it'll bother you, it might bother your little girl later on in life or y- your little sister someone. So please be involved and pay attention to what's happening. All right. That's right. Aisha, Rebecca. Yeah. I mean, it's painful because we understand that this country was built on a a legacy of, of dehumanization 
of first the indigenous peoples and then our enslaved African royalty and families, right? And so as upsetting as it is, I can't say that I am surprised, but I also feel that it's a, it's a, a another call to action, right? It's another opportunity for folks to mobilize and to organize and to make sure that we are doing everything we can to protect the most vulnerable among us. And far too often, the most vulnerable among us look like the folks who are on this panel. And, and that should be of great alarm to folks who you may not have female reproductive organs, you may not have highly melanated skin, but it should matter to you. And we need to vote, we need to be vocal, and we need to behave as though it does matter because because it does. Absolutely. I guess I want to start this by centering it in my own experience because I do believe that the power is really in sharing and uplifting our individual experiences so that we illuminate how not isolated they are. Just got married a month ago. I am living with my mother, me and my husband. We are continuing to care give. We are not in a position to start thinking about starting a family. And that's not to say that it's not that we're interested in it. But now is not the time. And we've had some tough conversations about what we, what we, we would do if we had a surprise <laughs> or if, God forbid, we had a difficult pregnancy or anything like that. And what Friday did was take away my choice. And why is that personally offensive? Because I've worked very hard to make use of the sacrifices my family has made for us to be here. I have worked very hard to get my education, to have my career, to have the life that I have worked hard for. I have worked very hard to curate a world for myself that my society says I shouldn't be able to have. And you, what you are saying is that this one area of choice in my life that could easily upend so many of those sacrifices is now in the hands of the government. I'm not okay with that. Um, and, and there are so many other women of color that I know are in similar experiences. I think we know that something like 40% of women that have, that seek abortions actually already have children, which means that they're already caregivers. So this is about controlling our choice. If we are the income earners, if we are the breadwinners, if we are the ones changing the faces of our family and uplifting them out of poverty, then why does the government get to say you don't get to control your ability to stay on track with your plans, that you don't get to control your outcomes. That feels intentional, it feels racist, and the only way to really fight this is to fight back. And so what I will say is, I wanna empower every woman on this call, every person on this call, to see this as a personal attack and to do something about it. If you have the courage to show up every day for care, you have the courage to use your voice to fight this. If you have the courage to wake up every day and deliver ex everything that your family needs and still show up for your job and still somehow show up for the family, the children that need you, then you are needed in this fight. Your voice is needed. We need you to share your stories. We need you to uplift because this needs to change. And what I'm going to say is we need to carry the mantle. The same fight that our grandparents and our mothers fought it's ours now. And that's the reality. The things that we took for granted as being hard, ingrained rights just aren't. And so the reality is, yeah, as tired as we are, we still got to fight this fight. We've got to do it together. And the only way that we're going to gain the traction that we need is if we do this together. Because if we don't do this together, someone will always be left behind. Thanks so much for everybody's work today. I am looking forward to seeing more conversations. We have one minute left. Brandy, take us home. Anything you'd like to say to our fellow Twitters, tweeters, that was very corny, sorry. Uh, <laughs> anything you'd like to say to the congregation before we close okay. out? <laughs> First of all, thank y'all. It is power in numbers. And thank you all for chiming in with us, listening with us, caring enough to join this conversation and please share this because everyone I feel like knows someone that's a caregiver in some sort of space. So I, 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 I challenge you to have more empathy and help a little bit more. Be there. Like we said, we need each other to make it through this. So thank you all for that. And all of us caregivers, I challenge us to do more for ourselves, take time for ourselves and know that we're doing a good job. Not be so hard. Be gentle on yourselves as well.
You cannot pour from an empty cup, folks. Until next time, please follow us on caringacross.org. Check us out on the website and follow us on all social media outlets. From myself, Shantae Wolf, Aisha, and Rebecca. Good night. Good night, y'all. Good night. Thank you, everybody.